Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the show. Have a great return appearance from last year's Realignment guest, Elliot Ackerman. Elliot came on to promote 2034, a novel of the next world war, last year, which he co-authored with Admiral James Stavridis, who also made an appearance on the show. Now he's got a new book out. It's called The Fifth Act, America's End in Afghanistan. Elliot has served at pretty much all levels of the military, going from Marine Infantry Officer to a Special Operations Officer, and then transitioning into the CIA. So this book is a long time coming. It's cataloging his time, both in Afghanistan and then afterwards, and then his role in the evacuation of Afghan allies during the fall of Kabul. There's a lot here. It's a great book. Can't recommend it enough. Like Once again, 2034 is one of the biggest books we sold in our bookshop last year, so cannot recommend either of these features enough. If you enjoy this conversation, would love to get your support. You can go to realignment.supercast.com. Once again, that's realignment.supercast.com. Five a month, 50 a year, 500 for a lifetime membership plays a huge role in keeping the show independent and getting us where we need to go to deliver the news and conversation you all enjoy. But with said, huge thank you to Lincoln Network, and I cannot emphasize enough how great Elliot's books are and recommend you check the link in our bookshop while also checking out our sub stack as well. Hope you enjoy this conversation. Elliot Ackerman, welcome back to The Realignment. Thanks for having me, Marshall. Yeah, it's really great to chat with you. We had you on last year to talk about 2034. We also had your mm-hmm. co-author, Admiral uh, Stavridis, also talk about the book. So I want to throw people back to 2034 if they want to get a different perspective on a future-facing issue. But here we're going to speak about the Fifth Act, your new book about America and Afghanistan. But honestly, it's about something bigger than that. Right? I think what I've always enjoyed about your career is you're really rooted in, in the past, the present, and the future in terms of what you're focusing on and the way you tell your experiences. And I think this is actually a moment where that's particularly useful. So let me just start with the, I think the newsiest bit. Considering the themes of the book and considering your interest in the Asia Pacific, the future of the Marine Corps, the intelligence community, do you think America overall big picture is in a better strategic position considering we left Afghanistan a year later than we were given the September 2021 status quo. Let's put aside for a second the withdrawal, the logistics, how it went about, like just our strategic position. Uh, no, uh, it's short. Um, you know, and, and I think it's important like, to, back it, to back it all the way up to sort of how the end game in Afghanistan developed, um, you know, because this isn't just something that, you know, you can place on one president, right? I mean, this goes back. Uh, I mean, over two decades. But my my view was always that uh, if you look at war, where the war was before Trump started negotiating uh, our exit, which I think was a horrible negotiation uh, where we we really got run on. You know, we had basically done it had taken longer than anyone wanted, but we had gotten the war in Afghanistan. It was primarily being fought by the Afghans. Um, they were showing success. The Taliban had control over uh, de, minim- de minimis parts of the country, no population centers. And we were sustaining that for, you know, a troop presence that was less than 10,000 U.S. troops a year uh, with de minimis casualties. For instance, two years before the end of the war in Afghanistan, more Marines were killed in training accidents on Camp Pendleton alone than were killed in action in all of Afghanistan. So if we're just talking kind of like pure real politics strategies, I'm like, okay, you know, you've got to measure war in costs, not sunk costs, but actual costs today. So is a cost of less than 10,000 US troops uh, taking really de minimis casualties, is that worth it to have the country of Afghanistan be a friendly country where we have a footprint, uh, large air bases that share a border with China, in Central Asia, you know, is that worth the cost each year? And I would argue, yes, from a strategic point of view, if I was the president of the United States, I would want to know that I had that platform in Afghanistan. Again, shares a border with China, shares a border with Iran. It's a it's a good piece of real estate um, to have a toehold in versus where we're at now, where we have absolutely no foothold uh, in Afghanistan. We've gone through, you know, a, a pretty profound uh 
national humbling in terms of our military might. I mean, it was it was embarrassing to see how things ended in Afghanistan. And, and I think there's a direct correlation between the way the war in Afghanistan ended, uh, which was the greatest military failure NATO had had experienced with the invasion of Ukraine six months later. I mean, I think you're I think a person would be deluding themselves. They didn't think that there was a connection there. Um, but we have overperformed in Ukraine. And we can talk about that later, meaning the NATO alliance has. So it's just from a strategic point of view. No, I sort of like door number one more than door number two that we took. But but I don't say all of that without sympathy and without understanding the emotional cross currents that led to the decision uh, to just pull all the plugs out of Afghanistan. But I think it's a decision that we really need to look at hard. And I think at the core of that decision to leave Afghanistan comes down to the types of stories and narratives we as Americans apply around war and how sometimes they do us a real disservice. Yeah. And this is where the news cycle is benefiting this conversation. You know, last week, um, the head of Al Qaeda, you know, Zahahi, you know, Zahahi was killed. And that was accomplished without the U.S. having the same presence in Afghanistan. So I just know that a skeptic to your position, I'm, I, I agree with you on the merits of it, but a skeptic is so, certainly saying, wait a second, we're still fulfilling the counterterror mission, even though we're not there. So what would your response to that be? So with regards to Zawahir, here, I actually think it's sort of, it's remarkable. First of all, I am one of these people who thinks like the timing of all of that. I'm a little skeptical of the timing. You know, we watch these people for a long, long time. So to have him killed right in August as we're approaching the one year mark to me did seem a little bit political. Um, but all that being said, I think when you look at, when you look at Zawahiri, um, it's actually, it is a remarkable example of why we got so much wrong for so long in the terror wars. That's what you want to, you know, that's what a person wants to call them. And that the issue of question was never whether or not the United States and our allies were good at killing terrorists. We were very good at killing members of Al Qaeda. Um, we've been good at it for 20 years. We were exceptional at it in Iraq, became very good at it in Afghanistan, the tribal areas of Pakistan and around the world. That is not the question, but killing terrorists, killing members of Al Qaeda, that's not a, that's not a strategy. That's a tactic. And so often, uh, our policymakers have conflated tactics with strategy. Okay, so you killed Zawahiri. What does that do for the United States with regards to handling the broader threat of Al Qaeda? And I would argue, you know, it doesn't really do a lot and it doesn't fit into a larger strategic narrative. Um, so if we say that the strategy of the Biden administration is to be able to kill terrorists inside of Afghanistan without being in Afghanistan, to me, that's not an Afghanistan or really even a counterterrorism strategy. It's just a tactic. You've you've developed a tactical capability to be able to do it remotely, you know. And maybe we and maybe we have, you know. I mean, obviously there was also the drone strike during the collapse of Kabul uh, that killed a bunch of innocent civilians. So I think we can look at this capability somewhat skeptically still, um, but we have never in 20 years of war, really been able to get our arms around what is the strategy for dealing with transnational terrorism. And there hasn't really been uh, a coherent one. I would argue that the, the, the most coherent one, which wasn't an effective strategy, but it was at least an articulated strategy, was Bush's doctrine of preemption um, that led to the Iraq war. I mean, he was very clear, national security strategy, we will fight the terrorists wherever they are. And I would say that was a flawed strategy. And in the wake of Bush's doctrine of preemption, we never really got another coherent strategy from any administration. Yeah. And the way you're articulating this, I like the tactics versus strategy distinction, because you could think about the 1990s. The 1990s were all tactics. The 1990s were, OK, there's an attack. Let's launch a you know, cruise missile strike against right. Sudan. There is a concern. Let's kind of have, you know, Afghan tribesmen surveil where we thought Osama bin Laden was. It obviously didn't work, but I think that's a good way to, to frame it. Something I'm really curious about is I would just like to hear an articulation of your feelings towards the war in Afghanistan, because something that might not have been captured by a listener if they haven't read the book yet, is there's something for everyone in the story you're telling about the war. So for example, there's a section where you're talking about how we built all of our forward operating bases out of plywood. And you obviously can't actually build a serious sustained presence. And I'm sure your most Hudson Institute, Hudson Institute neocom would say, exactly. We should have, you know, max booted our way to the you know future in Afghanistan. At the same time, though, you're also telling stories about the Afghanistan papers in the Washington Post, which talks about how, you know, the broader military State Department, et cetera, told very concerted 
I don't want to say lies because I think that is a little difficult, but just we're very, very, let's say, misdirecting about progress in the country. So just what is your just sum up position on the war, especially after, let's say, you know, December 2001? Well, that's a really big question. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, listen, I think in a little bit, it comes to how I structured this book, which gets into the title, The Fifth Act. You know, why is it called The Fifth Act? Um, and the acts of the book are, politically speaking, it's a book divided. So act one is Bush. Uh, then act two is Obama, Trump, Biden. And the fifth act is the Taliban. And so there is a larger political arc that goes through the book. Then the book sort of follows five evacuation cases that I was involved in over uh, the summer of 2021. Uh, and those, those evacuations had different outcomes. Some were successful, some were not successful, uh, and the reasons for that. And then the last um, arc of the book is about an incident I was involved in in 2008 when I was a Marine special operator. Um, and this idea of what does it mean to leave nobody behind? You know, because sort of running through all of this is this theme of, you know, we don't leave our people behind. I mean, that is a code that is deeply embedded in the U.S. military, um, but it's not exclusive to the U.S. military. I mean, it is a code as old as war. And if you if you read the Iliad, I mean, in the Iliad, when Achilles kills Hector, he drags Hector's body back to his camp. And Hector's father, King Priam of the Trojans, comes in and the book basically ends with Priam begging for his son's body to bring him back and repatriate his body. So this is a, these are very old themes. And so as Afghanistan was falling, you could see that theme as, as all of these people who were involved in the end, kind of crowdsourcing this evacuation, in addition to you know, the efforts of the, the, the Marines and soldiers on the ground, are sort of trying to make good on that. You know, what does it mean to leave no one behind? So when I try to when I try to um, so that idea of like, how do you sum up a 20 year war? You know, the, one of the genesis of writing this book was um, a, a friend of mine who has a, uh, you know, a, a very successful sub, uh, sub stack kind of came to me in the heat of this and was like, I'm gathering a few people to write about Afghanistan. Will you give me 500 words? And I was busy and tired and didn't feel like writing at the moment. And I was like, I don't really want to do this. And she said to me, I'm like, come on, like people, I'm like, what do you want me to write? And she said, you know, and she said, people don't understand what's happening because they haven't really been paying attention. So could you just explain uh, in 500 words what's happening in Afghanistan? And I was like, oh, my God. And she, you know, how do you do that? 20 years of war. And she said, well, this whole thing is just a tragedy. People won't understand it. And that's why it's five acts, too. It's because in classic dramatic structures, tragedies are told in five acts um, from Horace to Shakespeare. So. You know, if you ask me to summarize the 20 years of war, it's sort of it's the yeah, it's it's. It's it's tragedy. It's the these, you know, continually compounding human foibles, times where we, you know, maybe could have it could have gone in a different direction if we limited the scope of the mission. Um, you know, times when we see what we believe, you know, is success, uh, but because it turns elusive. So it's, you know, and at the end of the day, yeah, it's it's you know, it's just a it's it's a tragedy. The whole the whole thing, the whole way the way it ended to me is is is, is tragic. And I, I would just add, you know, one uh, brief point, Marshall. And I know I'm not giving you a political answer. I'm kind of giving you an emotional answer here. No, that's what I but, wanted. Uh, yeah, yeah. But well, there was like a moment when everything was collapsing in August. It was before Kabul had, had had fallen, but it was when it was really visceral. And I was, I was on the phone a few times just with a. a an old dear friend of mine from the Marines. And he and I, I write about him in the book. His name's Josh. And we had been, we had, we had just by coincidence had these very parallel military careers. We kind of wound up doing all the same deployments. We were both in Iraq at the same time, both in Afghanistan. We worked in the same units. And, um, and he was actually, he was wounded a number of times. The last time he was wounded, he was forced to medically retire out of the Marine Corps um, and has had a successful business career since. So we're just sort of on the phone trying to piece together like, you know, what's going on. And we had both observed that we were much more upset watching the end of Afghanistan, for instance, than we were, you know, in 2014, when the Islamic State, you know, blitzkrieg through Iraq and like took Fallujah, where he and I had both fought and, you know, and raised up the Black Banner. And that for us didn't seem nearly as difficult as watching Afghanistan. We were kind of trying to, it was like, why do we feel so much more upset about this? Like, why is this one really hitting us and Cal giving us some sleepless nights. Uh, and I think what we dialed in on was, you know, there's only two times in American history where we have gone to war and that war has been predicated based off of an attack on the homeland. 
The first time was the Second World War in Pearl Harbor. And that was a war that ended with an unequivocal, unconditional American victory that led to an American century. And the second time was 9-11 and the way the Afghan war began. Now, it obviously veered in many directions after, but it was ending very clearly. This murky war that it's sort of been this like miasma was suddenly ending in such a clear way in August. And it wasn't ending with a unconditional victory. It was really with an unconditional defeat in which the, the U.S. military and NATO are being dictated terms by 50,000 Taliban fighters. Um, and so to preside, feel like your, your war was ending that way. Um, you know, it was, it was very jarring. And this incredible irony, too, he and I are both Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans, that the Iraq war, which was always sort of the bad war, the one we never should have fought. And I'm not going to say we won the Iraq war, but I would say we didn't lose it in the way we were losing Afghanistan quite so clearly. We sort of muddled along. They've now held five sets of parliamentary elections in Iraq. Like it's, it's sort of a grayer outcome. But that Afghanistan, you know, the good war, you know, Josh was class of 2001 out of the Naval Academy. Like this was so defining for us. And it was ending in, in just such a brutal defeat. Uh, it was, it was, it was, it was tough. And again, leads me back to this word tragedy and it leads me to trying to kind of structure the book as a tragedy. No. And that's why I like how you frame this as a emotional answer, because for background sake, you know, we leave Iraq in 2011 um, mm-hmm. via, because we couldn't secure a longer term status of forces agreement with the Iraqi government. So 2014, 2015, obviously you fought there, friends of yours, you know, fought and died there. But in a way, to your point, that doesn't feel like a military defeat in a way that this would. Is that, is that a good way of really, of really summing it up? Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, even going back to, you know, you, you mentioned like the 2011 status of forces agreement. Um, you know, war is politics. And so often we lose sight of that. You know, like everyone's looking at the fall of Afghanistan, like, oh, my God, we put you know, $80 billion of equipment all these years. How is it? How is it that it's collapsing? It's like, listen. You're making a mistake if you're viewing this as a tactical defeat on the battlefield. How are they not advancing and flanking and fighting? It's like, this is politics. The second we said we were leaving in September, it was this massive vote of no confidence. And, you know, all of these Afghans basically made a political decision and said, you know, the wind is blowing to the Taliban. We're not going to we're not going to fight and die um, for this Afghan government. But I bring that up with regards to the 2011 status of forces agreement. Because, you know, I would argue that that is not the reason we left Iraq. Um, it, it, listen, if we wanted a status of forces agreement with Iraq, we can get a status of forces agreement with Iraq, that that was the, the excuse that was given. I mean, the real reason we left Iraq was a political decision. It was a domestic political decision. We left in 2011. President Obama was up for re-election. He had won and run in 2008 very clearly that Iraq had been the bad war. He hadn't voted for the Iraq war. It's one of the key ways. One of one of Hillary Clinton's key weaknesses in the 2008 Democratic primary in 2011, he's up for reelection. He needs to deliver the end of the Iraq war for his base. Um, Like that was a very important promise. So, you know, what do we say? Oh, well, we can't negotiate the status of forces agreement. So this is one of the reasons why we're ending and it's time to end the war. Um, And I would argue, I mean, and I'm not saying this in a, you know, I'm not trying to go after Obama per se. I kind of, you know, in a partisan way. I'd say, listen, it was a shrewd political move. Like I pull out in 2011. I run my election in 2012. I can run on the fact that I ended the Iraq war. If things flare up again in Iraq, which, oh, by the way, they did, I'll already be into my second term and I'll deal with it. Um, And if they don't, then great, they don't. So um, I think the reason the Iraq war ended in 2011 was because of the 2012 presidential elections and, you know, Afghanistan being... uh, the good war. And I think that's just important to bring up in a larger context of, you know, all of these wars, you cannot lose sight of the, the political as you're discussing developments on the battlefield. Um, they, they absolutely intersect. Yeah. And something I'm curious about, and this also falls into the unfair question from an interviewer perspective, right? You're, you're saying it was, it was tough to write 500 words on, on the subject. It's tough to answer an interview question directly on this. So I'm giving you as much leeway as, as you need on this question. What would you say moving forward into the future, the main takeaway the lesson from the specifically like the Afghan war is. So think of 
we spend 20 years entangled in Vietnam and the real takeaways are, well, like what's not overstate domino theory, what's not overstate colonial wars versus wars of national liberation. Let's not um, fight that type of war. And that then, you know, leads us to 1991 and, President Bush says we've, you know, kicked the, you know, Vietnam syndrome. What is an early version of that story that you could think of us able to tell ourselves about the war in Afghanistan for the next few decades? I think there are a lot of there are a lot of parallels to the lessons you just brought up with regards to Vietnam. Um, and let me maybe I'll hit on some of those in the second part of this answer. But the headline, if I could put one headline on the war in Iraq or in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Um, these sort of terror wars that we should learn and um, that is unique to them. So is that, listen, every time the United States has gone to war, uh, we have to go to war with a construct. And what I mean by a construct is we have to figure out how are we going to sustain the war? And you basically, broadly speaking, you sustain a war in two ways, through blood and through treasure. Blood, the troops who are going to fight it, treasure, how you fund it. So, you know, revolutionary war, we, you know, got foreign aid from the French, uh, and as well as troops from the French, that was essential to us, you know, Rochambeau winning that war. The American Civil War, first ever draft in the United States is in the American Civil War, as well as the first ever income tax. Second World War, you know, we know war bond drives and national mobilization. Vietnam War, a war that was characterized by a very, very unpopular draft, which ultimately led to its end, you know, seven years in, but much quicker than these wars. 9-11 happens and America goes to war. And when we go to war, our leaders say, OK, what's the construct for this war? And in the past, those constructs have been sort of existentially dis disruptive and uncomfortable for the country. Like that's why Vietnam ended, because every 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 18 year old boy or man was getting drafted. Um, and so when we looked from Vietnam to, OK, how are we going to do these terror wars? How are we going to make a construct? The construct in terms of blood was our all volunteer military that we had created. We're going to fight this with an all volunteer military. In terms of treasure, it was we're going to fund this through deficit spending. And for instance, the last year the United States passed a balanced budget was 2001, and it's not a coincidence. So the result, though, of a war fought with an all-volunteer military and funded through deficit spending is an anesthetized populace. So unless you, know, you are in the military, you have a close family member in the military, uh, well, and you're not paying any taxes on this war, you're not going to feel it. You're, we are all insulated from it. So the reason the war on terror and the war in Afghanistan went on for 20 years wasn't because like we couldn't necessarily find the exact bit of battlefield alchemy. It was because it was designed to go on this long. It became politically very easy to perpetuate this war. No one was clamoring for its end. Actually, if you look in, um, in 2018, Rasmussen put a poll in the field in the lead up to the midterm elections. Uh, this was before Trump had started his negotiations with the Taliban. So Afghanistan had really become a back page issue and asked Americans, um, what do you think about the war of Afghanistan as a priority of an issue? And 48% of Americans, it's not that they said Afghanistan wasn't a priority issue for them. They couldn't even tell you if the war was still going on. They just didn't know anymore. They'd forgotten about it. Um, so to me, the great lesson of the Afghan war that is unique is we need to be very cognizant of how we structure our wars. And when a war is being served up to the American people in a construct, that's going to make it very easy to perpetuate that war. Be careful because you could wind up with a 20 year war. The other thing that that construct does, too, is now when we talk about war in America, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, these these military exercises that are going on in the Taiwan Straits right now with China. And we think about war. A war has sort of become this thing that like other people deal with, like, oh, well, if we do go to war with China, it's just going to be our great all volunteer military that handles that. And I can just go about my business. But I mean, you wait to be, you realize, like, if we were to ever be in a peer level, a war with a peer level adversary, it would not look like the war on terror. It would have to be resourced in a much more disruptive way. So to me, I think that is one of the great lessons of the war on terror. And then everything else you mentioned um, as well, Marshall, that sort of rhymes with the Vietnam War. Um, uh, I think is, you know, is also, also very important to keep in mind when we talk about Afghanistan. I want to pick apart those two points. Let's start with the all volunteer force and then taxation. So, you know, as, as you know, like one of the lessons that's taken away from the Vietnam war is that the draft not only was terrible for American domestic politics, but it actually pushed the U S military itself to the limit. 
um, you, you talk to anybody who came up in the post-Vietnam period and the consensus, at least from my research, my background, all, all those types of things is that the, the all volunteer forces had higher morale. It's combat effectiveness has been better. You're not taking a bunch of people for two year stints who don't want to be there. I don't see a strong set of evidence that there's large clamorings at levels within the military for bringing folks who are, you know, 18, not wanting to be there into the bit of it. So can you just like reckon with the contradiction between the fact that politically and maybe incentives wise and a, a draft of some sort would probably make sense. But I'm sure if you spoke to any of the type of flag officers who we've spoken with, they would almost certainly say, I don't want to go back to the days I learned about at West Point when everyone said it was terrible to work with that kid in 1972 who didn't want to be there. Sure. Um, well, first of all, I think it's important to decouple the fact of like, you know, the, the, popularity of a draft and how many Americans want a draft with the idea, like, is this good civics? So yeah. I fully acknowledge the part that if you were to put a poll in the field right now, I do not think you would see overwhelming support across categories in America to reinstituting a draft. Well, that thing, being, we're yeah. not even, but I would say, I would, I would argue even in the upper echelons of the DOD and the, and the actual like Pentagon, right? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I, yeah. and I, I think, I think you'd be surprised where you would see um, dissent. So like, a, so like if I, like, I'll sh just to share a brief anecdote. I was in 2014, um, uh, a good buddy of mine was killed in Afghanistan. Uh, and he, you know, I had since left the Marines, but he was a Marine special operator. And, uh, I was at his funeral at Arlington with another, uh, friend of mine, uh, who, uh, still works in special operations. And he and I basically were in the train of cars driving into Arlington and we're sitting there in our car kind of just waiting for things to move. And I remember we're looking across the Potomac north into DC. And frankly, we're, we're both kind of angry. You know, we're like, we mm. can't believe this is still going on and friends of ours are still getting killed. And this war is just sort of muddling along. And so um, I basically said something, the fact that, you know, man, I can't believe GIF is dead look at everybody across the city no one even knows or cares that he got killed last week um and uh and my friend said to me who by the way was you know still works in special operations today has done more deployments than anyone i know was in the iraq invasion in 2003 and that's how long he's been working at this and he basically said you know yeah i know i gotta tell you you know i'm for a draft and i said to him really i'm like could you imagine how bad we would have been, you know, our, if, if, if in our rifle platoons when we were like 23 year old lieutenants, if we had a bunch of conscripts in those platoons, how tough it would have been to lead them. And, and, you know, we wouldn't have been any good. And he looked at me and he said, you know, man, I'm not sure we need to be as good at this as we are. Um, and he means, you know, tactically speaking. So I think that people, many people, People in the military, it's not a secret to them. If you've been around for 20 years, why these wars went on so long. Um, and I think there is a lot of, you know, I have at least talked to people anecdotally and there's that, there's that hesitancy there. You know, I, um, I've, I've openly written, I'm for draft. I've written about it. My sort of construct of a draft, um, I actually called it my modest proposal, you know, in the Jonathan <laughs> yeah. Swift and um, would be that we would have a draft. Uh, it would take men and women because women can serve unrestricted in the U.S. military now. Um, it would it would be only 10% of the US military. So it's important to recognize that like, when you look at the history of the draft, it's not like the entire military was drafted. It was always just a segment of the military. Actually, the percentage of draftees in the US military in the Second World War was much higher than in Vietnam. In Vietnam, it's only uh, one in four. Oh, so yeah, much higher. Um, and everyone looks at that as like the greatest generation. I mean, this was the, our military at its best, citizen soldiers. So, and there's something to that. But in my mind, I'm like, oh, let's just keep it at 10%. That's not going to degrade the professionalism of these units. You'll mainly have volunteers. Um, and uh, one of the criticisms of the draft has also been that people can kind of, you know, weasel their way out of it. So like, well, I get drafted, but I get a very cushy job in like supply. So in my version of the draft is you can only be drafted into the combat arms. So like infantry, tanks, artillery, um, and that the only people who will be subject to the draft will be the children of individuals who register in the top income tax bracket to kind of keep away this classism that has always existed in the draft where, you know, people get the student deferments and, you know, 
no one from the Harvard's class of 1968 goes into the military, but you know, it's all guys who never went to college or maybe have a year of community college. Um, now, do I think that's going to happen? No, but I sort of bring it up as this thought experiment um, because it's what's, what are we trying to achieve when we talk about a draft? If we go back to our first principles, I think what we're just trying to achieve is like when America goes to war, we should have skin in the game. Everyone should have some skin in the game. It's not right in a Republic when that Republic goes to war and there's this 1% of the population that's living its life as though it's the second world war and is doing two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight deployments over a lifetime and seeing their friends get killed. And everyone else is just sort of hanging out at the mall. It's like everyone should have skin in the game. And one of the ways you do that is it's not necessarily the draft that solves this problem. It's the specter of the draft. The fact that every household that has a child in America that is turning 18 knows that that child whether they want to or not, is going to have to go put their lottery number down and see if they're going to have to do a two-year stint in the military. And I guarantee you, you know, if you turn on any cable news channel or you go on Twitter, people would be talking about issues of war and peace in a much more uh, centered way in our national conversation. That would be healthy for us and would actually demilitarize our society. It would make it incredibly difficult to have a war that's presided over by four different presidents. I think the Afghan war would have been done 10 plus years ago to a much better outcome um, if we had had some type of draft so that the American people had to pay attention to this issue. And so that when it, Kabul is falling, you know, I'm not getting notes from people I think are very educated and sophisticated saying, oh, no one understands what's going on because we just stopped paying attention 10 years ago. I want to be very, very, very delicate um, when I respond to this because obviously didn't serve. So there's, you know, <laughs> dynamics there on a couple of different levels, but do you worry? Actually, like, this, this is how, this is how I center this. I'm concerned that you are, and once again, it's a modest proposal. Think back to junior mm -hmm. AP English people. Like it's, you know, the Jonathan Swift reference, you're making yeah. a point with this proposal. I can't take it too literally, but I worry that you're framing your modest proposal too much around the world of 2001 and 2002, because my reading of what you're saying is, you know, you're, you made the joke about you being president earlier. So let's say for whatever reason, you're president in 2001. I get the sense that President Ackerman would have passed a modest but serious war tax to keep the deficit down and then also instituted some form of a draft as a response to 9-11. There's a, you could see how politically that could have worked. And my concern is, I could agree with all of that. You know, I was I was nine years old um, when uh, September 11th happened. So to, to a certain degree, I almost certainly would have been subject to that given the uh, broader way the war on terror went. But I'm concerned though that moving forward, as we're trying to say like, hey, how do we respond to the war in Ukraine? How do we respond to China's aggression? Questions of Taiwan, you've written about like the semiconductors, the supply chains, those bigger issues. I'm concerned that instituting any draft without a longer term societal buy-in to what our country's position in the world is, would basically just end in isolationist chaos. I think the worst thing you could do right now is basically give folks who want the US to pull back and disengage from authoritarian aggression, we'll be basically saying, oh, and by the way, Lockheed Martin, the lying CIA, and all these people you hate because of American domestic and cultural war politics are gonna send your kids to die. Wouldn't it be easier if we just let the Taiwanese and the Ukrainians hang? What if we just didn't give a shit about NATO? Like, I, I, that's, that's my concern. So what, what, what's your, I don't need like a counter argument. I'm just like, what's your response? Yeah, I think it's, listen, I think it's, first of all, if there was a draft today, no one would be going to Ukraine or to Taiwan. People would be serving in the same types of deployments they're doing now. Like we don't have, we don't have any troops committed there, but when some line gets crossed and you have a military and so the president reaches for that tool and he or she knows that that quiver is not just a bunch of volunteers who are an increasingly self-segregated part of society. You know, and if you look at military recruiting trends, it's, it's predominantly, particularly in the last 20 years, same regions, same families. Um, they're going to know this is actually a tool that is a cross-section of America. So I've got to make an argument for a Ukraine deployment or a Taiwan deployment that's going to appeal to all of America. And that is a much higher bar. I mean, you're talking about the lying military, the lying CIA. How about our lying politicians? I mean, I put them like top of the heap. And so the way I'm like, they don't get off the hook is they've got a military that has got everyday citizens in it. 
um, and required to serve in it. And it makes it much more difficult for them to behave in dysfunctional backdoor ways. So for instance, let's go back to like 2001 and 2002. I think when we talk about Afghanistan, there's sort of been these moments where, you know, if we're looking in hindsight, everyone throws up their arms. Oh, it was unwinnable. And one of the things that was remarkable watching the end of Afghanistan was seeing how this was indicative of how far it had receded out of Americans' minds Mm -hmm. was, um, was people conflating Afghanistan with Iraq. Well, you know, we never should have invaded them for weapons of mass destruction. And he was like, no, 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 no. Like you got, you're getting the wars mixed up. Well, we shouldn't be an Arab, you know, we shouldn't be an Arab country. It's like Afghanistan is not an Arab country. They're Afghan, I mean, so it, but it showed the lack of literacy because this had fallen away. So when you look back at 2001 and 2002 in hindsight, you say, okay, is there any way after the 9-11 attacks, we could have had a positive outcome in Afghanistan? I would argue the one way that could have, that could have happened would have been if we had gone in, if we had done this initial punitive mission, which kind of ran from 2001 into early 2003, and then we had worked with Karzai to co-opt portions of the Taliban into a governance structure in Afghanistan that was led by non-Taliban members. That, you know, that was maybe the one way out. Mm-hmm. But the problem that we had was you know, we had neocons who wanted to go invade Iraq. And when they looked at it, you know, what are the political costs of going to invade Iraq? There was no big anti-war movement. There was no, it was, you know, no one. There were actually really benefits. If, if, if anything, it was politically popular. Yeah, it was politically sort of popular. And when they projected out, well, what happens if we fail in Iraq? It's the, the, the cost of failure is much lower if the people involved in the failure are part of this all volunteer military. And they're not everyday Americans. Whereas if you fail and you've got a draft going on, you got huge huge problems. I mean, it's important to remember, like President Bush gets reelected in November 2004 when there's no WMD found. When I remember that election, I was actually, we were getting ready to go into Fallujah. We went in November 9th, 2004, which was five days after the election. I mean, we all knew it's like the election's going to happen and then we're going to go um, to go back to this idea of like, it's all about politics. So, um, so if you ask me, if we had had a draft in 2001 and 2002, I'm not saying that we would have gotten the outcome that I described, but I think that outcome becomes more likely because our political class looking at the costs of failure would say there's a much higher, if Iraq goes the wrong way, I'm never going to get reelected. If I even try to make an argument to the American people, we need to start another war. It's going to be very, very difficult for me if I've got a military where there are sons and daughters across this country who might not want to be there, who will be fighting. That's going to be very difficult. So, um, but you're realizing your point is well taken. I mean, we need to, you know, this is like you, you've got to find the right the right balance, I think. Um, But I think that having, if the American way of war going forward is all volunteer military, and we just throw it onto our deficit, particularly given the financial problems we're having right now, that's not a sustainable way of war. And, And if you, and if you look to talk about domestic political politics, I mean, from, from Caesar's Rome to Napoleon's France, when you have a large standing military coupled with incredibly dysfunctional domestic politics, Democracy doesn't last long in a republic. And that is the exact dynamic we have going on right now. I mean, the founding fathers warned about that dynamic. That's why we did not have a large standing military when this nation was founded. Um, and I think it is it is an issue that we should be paying more attention to than we necessarily are at the moment. No, and it's kind of funny because to your point, even putting this on the table forces people like me to actually do our homework and make the argument. Here's my broad concern then though. Um, I particularly like the chapter where you like wrote a bit about American domestic politics. You referenced Catherine Gale. She's been on the show before, spoken with her political dysfunction, politics industry, all, all of those bits. I'm concerned that it's not possible in our current political environment to make arguments anymore. I'm concerned that you raise all the very valid points you just made. And I say, you know, I bring my most like West Wing, like Jed Bartlett, well-written speech about how America has to remain committed. And I apologize for the Iraq war, even though I wasn't exactly alive for, you know, those bad parts of it, obviously. And it doesn't matter because it's at the end of the day, not a good faith argument and not in either direction, basically. So I think the broad question I'll ask you then is, consider I know you're, you're interested in the subject, like to what detriment is for us, to what detriment is it? that we're not able, it seems to have like just a good faith argument on, on these things anymore. 
Huge detriment. I think it's the greatest national security strategy that faces the United States is our own domestic political dysfunction. Um, the only wrinkle I would add in this, which I think was interesting to observe this past year, yeah. was after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, you had this sort of brief moment where there was a bipartisan consensus that we needed to condemn this. Bro, I mean, you, you like the, 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 the far right and far left sort of doing what they do um, and actually interestingly mirroring each other's you know arguments. But there yes. was a pretty broad consensus that, yes, you know, Russia should not be allowed to eliminate and destroy the Ukrainian you know, or invade and destroy the Ukrainian people um, in the type of ethnic Ukrainian genocide. Like we all could agree on that. But it was interesting to observe. I would say that that was the first time I had seen that type of consensus since 9 11. Mm. Uh, now, it wasn't quite as intense, obviously, as the consensus was around 9 11, but you could, like, you know, you could sort of smell it in the air a little bit. Um, and that to me gave me a little bit of a little bit of hope. Um, and it was also interesting to see that juxtaposed with the response to COVID. Like, uh, you know, I don't know about you, Marshall, but like, you know, up before the pandemic, I would often be in, you know, some version of the conversation where we would be despondently looking at the state of American politics, wondering mm -hmm. whether or not anything could get the country back together again, saying, well, maybe it will come some type, you know, maybe it will need to be some type of existential crisis. Then the pandemic hits, you know, hundreds of thousands of Americans are dying and we enter probably the most divisive political year we've had since 1968. And so that was sort of unnerving. Like, well, the crisis arrived and it only pushed us further apart. But then to have sort of on the heels of the most intense parts of COVID, this Ukraine thing happen, and suddenly we're all together again, it was interesting. And I don't, I don't have some conclusion about it. It just shows the difference of our psychology. So a pandemic that kills a million Americans drives us apart, but a war in Ukraine with our perennial adversary, the Russians, kind of intuitively brings us all together. You know, what is that? What does that necessarily say about us? And also, what does it say about our, our psychology? Does it mean we have mm -hmm. a militarized psychology? Like I was sort of, I was talking with a friend of mine the other day and um, we were wondering like if you could dial in a ratio, like if you could figure out how much people cared for a death that was a COVID related death versus a death that was like a terrorism related death. So like how many COVID deaths equal the feeling someone has for one terrorist related deaths? Is yeah. it, you know, 10 people die in a terrorist attack and that equals 100,000 people dying of COVID or is it 100? I mean, like what is, because there's clearly a huge discrepancy here. Um, and this friend of mine actually works for, um, uh, works for New York City and he was making the point to me. He's like, you know, it's remarkable. All of the COVID protocols that, that are in place, that were put in place in the pandemic we we're all stripping away and we're getting rid of them so rapidly. And it's tough because, you know, you have monkey pox we're dealing with and we know this is not going to be the last pandemic. But he's like, but all of the protocols that were put in place after 9-11, whether they make sense or not, they're still there and they will not go away. And so it's, so it's just, you know, how do we psychologically process different crises uh, in our society. And I think a lot of that speaks to, you know, whether or not we can ever get on the same page or for certain national crises versus other national crises. Yeah. And I think what you're, and this is, once again, like this is not an episode where anyone's coming up with a broad solution, but my immediate take from what you're describing, contrasting COVID response to post 9-11 responses. And this is where the cost argument becomes difficult, right? So we're lamenting the fact that, you know, President Bush said to just go shopping, you know, after the, you know, it's the cliche, it's, 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 in, it's everyone references, you did not reference this in your book. So thank you. But everyone yeah. makes a reference to this in this book. So it's a cliche, yeah. um, but go shopping. We're not going to ask anything of you. We're going to have all the all volunteer force served. And then with COVID, we asked a lot of people and that's where everything yeah. breaks down. So, yeah. you know, we asked people to basically severely impact a generation of school kids when it came to school closure. We asked people to wear masks in a serious way. There were, there were real costs. And I think in a weird way, and, and it's not perfect, right? In terms of the metaphor, but I think those real costs actually very quickly turned COVID into a culture war issue that didn't give us that year. So for example, like, let's get real for a second. 
I don't know anything about the Patriot Act beyond the fact that I'm broadly supposed to say as like a centrally minded person that it's like overreach and all these different bad things happen, this, this or that. But like that first year after September 11, we're locking airplane doors. I know the TSA sucks. I just traveled. It's fine. But genuinely, it's fine. We had that year and we didn't have that year with COVID. So I'm curious, like, what what do you think could have given us that year to just get to a baseline? And then we debate like those upper, like broader culture war infected ones. Well, it's interesting. I I don't know what would have necessarily given us that year, because I think the way the year played out was just reflective of our, our very dysfunctional politics, which in 2020 and 2021 were very different than they were 20 years ago. Um, but what, but what was interesting to me mm-hmm. is so like, I'm sitting here in January of maybe 2022 and I'm like, oh, well, it's me. America will never be able to come together over anything again in the way we did in 9-11. And then Ukraine happens and suddenly it seems like we are all on the same page. Yeah. And I'm like, why, why did that happen when COVID, which is like such a spectacular issue, didn't do it. And I think it comes down to like, America, our American psychology and war and the place where we compartmentalize war um, and the stories we tell ourselves about war. You know, we, I think most Americans, we don't consider ourselves being a highly militarized society. We are. It's like everywhere in our culture. Um, You know, what's the huge movie this summer? I mean, Top Gun 2 Maverick. I mean, like, you know, every, you know, every, every movie that's an action movie, people are getting shot, they're getting killed. I mean, there is just so much of that in our culture. Um, that it's sort of like the, um, you know, it's like the two fish swimming along. One fish says to, you know, the other fish, you know, how's the, how's the water? And it says, what's water? You know what I mean? Like it's, it's the water we swim in. Um, so I don't like, I don't have an, I don't have an answer. Like what's the prescriptive thing we need to do. I do though feel like maybe war exists in a, in a kind of, segregated part of our brain when it comes to unity. I can't say that decisively like you, I'm still sort of watching, but this Ukraine experience makes me think that if China were to do something in Taiwan, it makes me think that I don't know if it makes me hopeful or frankly despondent that the only thing we can get on the same sheet of music about is fighting wars. Yeah, no, like when you, when you put it that way, you know, as we're nearing the end here, something I'm, cause once again, I, I mean, I mean this here is that I, I really, I have a difficult, and this gets to your broader critique of the American political system. Like I have a difficult time like placing you like in different categories um, in just a sense of, so is your prescription for American foreign policy moving forward? Is it, is it hawkish? Are we too disengaged? We engage more just like what, what is your, because once again, all these answers are getting figured out. So I don't want a, right. what is the prescription? I want, how are you thinking about Taiwan Ukraine, Russia, like how should listeners who are thinking through this, but are still obviously rooted in how 9-11 was for me in fourth grade, how the fall of Mosul was for me when I was graduating college and for you obviously fighting in these wars, like how should we just think of them? Well, I think it's interesting. So like what's happening with Russia and China right now and Taiwan and Ukraine, I think is part of a very different conversation than the war on terror. And one of the, uh, I think, ironically, one of the, you know, when I was coming into the military, this like late 90s, early 2000s, everyone was talking about, you know, this is, you know, Frank Fukuyama, the end of history. Everyone's talking about how the great, the the great threat to the United States will be transnational terrorism um, as countries dissolve. And that's what we need to be paying attention to. And sort of ironically, that wound up being true. The great threat to the United States was transnational terrorism, but not because there was another terrorist attack in the. In the United States, and oh, by the way, I think like if you had told us on September 12th, 2001, the day after that we were there 20 years, there would never be a 9-11, people would be amazed. And what an incredible achievement. I think because, you know, it was very- They would very, say, wow, well, we got it together in America. Yeah, we got it. We did it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's the cost. You know, what was the cost of that? And I would argue one of the opportunity costs of 20 years of terror wars was we just stopped paying attention to all of our old adversaries. And now they're sort of back after 20 years. It's like, it's Russia, it's China, it's North Korea, it's the Iranians, it's the access of these countries. And what are they all sort of angling at and doing? And I think <laughs> what you're really seeing is an articulation that these countries are no longer happy with 
um, the, the, the post second world war status quo that has, you know, the big five in the UN and has a very, uh, U S centric worldview, or at least a bipolar worldview, you know, they want a realignment and, uh, and they're, and these are countries that are authoritarian countries, you know, they're leveraging tech to amplify their authoritarianism. I, and that's going to be, you know, in my mind, like that's the challenge of the next 10, 15, 20 years is like, what is that realignment going to happen? What does it look like? And it is pretty existential. Um, so if you ask me sort of, where do you fix me? What do I care about? Like, I care about that. I don't want to live in a world where China and I don't want my children to be living in a world where China is the leading economy sets terms for the rest of the world because you cannot exist economically unless you have the support of the CCP, um, where America has sort of been reg- you know, relegated to a second rate global power and just a regional power. Um, and the classic small L liberal democracies are in retreat. And we have a strong access of authoritarian nations led by China. Like, you want to live in that world? I don't want to live in that world. I don't want to be an old man watching my grandchildren run around in that world. And so, you know, we need to do something about it. So like Ukraine, you know, I'm hawkish on Ukraine, not because I'm a hawk necessarily, but because I'm like, that is a battlefield in that, in that war. And that's actually a righteous fight. Like we should be fighting that and fighting it. However, you know, whether we're fighting it economically, fighting it through influence, like we should be engaged and awake to the fact that this is going on. Um, and it's a, and it's a critical issue and we should stop fighting about all the dumb things that we typically fight about in the United States. So for these last two questions, they're more, more, more personal in nature. So question number one would be, um, you really speak really openly about your career for the first time, just in a complete full picture here, you know, Marine Corps, Marine Corps, special forces, CIA paramilitary officer, um, then to your career as an author, obviously, and then also helping folks get out uh, of Kabul as, as the city is falling. I think with the exception of the city of Kabul falling part, I think the number one thing I get from the audience whenever we talk about these issues is just like a deep distrust of every institution that you've been a part of. And you write about this too. Obviously, the US military in of itself is still the most trusted institution in the country right now. But talk to a Republican, ask them their thoughts on General Miley. You know, Milley, let's get frank, that's going to go a bunch of different directions, especially with the recent news about his comments about Trump and the Wehrmacht in World War II. Whole other episode, but the point is it's getting controversial. How do you recommend these institutions, which I just think need to exist on 15 different levels, how, as we're transitioning to this new era, do you think they can go about regaining trust in the middle of all the difficulties we're talking about? Well, I think they, you know, one of the reasons that the U.S. military remains the, you know, the most trusted institution in the United States is because it's one of the very few institutions that has not been thoroughly politicized. Although, obviously, you know, Milley's remarks and what we, you know, what we've seen in the last year, there is certainly a push to politicize the U.S. military. And oh, by the way, I mean, you want to talk about threats to the United States? God help us if our military becomes politicized, because in the, in the military, it might sound obvious, but like. The military, you know, kind of looks like America. I mean, there's some variance there, but, you know, everyone has their political biases. You know, when you put on a uniform, you don't get rid of your political bias. You just sort of take a code generally of omerta. You don't you don't say it. You don't you know, you don't hang it out there like most Americans do. So if you politicize the U.S. military, particularly in an environment where we seem to be going from contested election to contested election and you have you know, national level politicians at some time saying we should be evoking the Insurrection Act to bring order to Washington, D.C. I mean, you know, you don't have to be a novelist to come up with a storyline where that ends very, very badly for America, American democracy. Um, but, you know, what would I say to people who are distrustful of these institutions is that, you know, institutions are people. I mean, at the end of the day, like they're not you know, they're not solely these sort of faceless, evil, mustache twisting institutions. I mean, they are people. Um, sadly, the people who tend to politicize these institutions are our political class who do it for short term political gain. And what's left in the rubble of that is an institution that everyday Americans don't trust anymore because all they've been seeing on their television screen is uh, how one side or the other is politicizing the institution. I will say kind of in one specific critique that I would have in American life right now 
is you have many retired leaders of these institutions in their post government lives, whether they be retired directors of the FBI, the CIA, you know, retired four star generals and admirals, very, very vocal about American democracy, um, signing letters, you know, on the right and on the left. That really doesn't help. I wish we could stop doing that as a culture. I wish our culture would, you know, there'd be some acknowledgement like that. That's not appropriate behavior because I think for many Americans, it's difficult um, to distinguish the retired Mm -hmm. senior level official and the acting one. So when, you know, the retired director of CIA signs some very partisan letter, you know, that's confusing. I think for a lot of Americans, I think, oh, that's the position of the FBI. It's like, no, or the CIA or the, you know, the U S Navy. And it's like, no, that person's retired. So now they're speaking as a private citizen, but they get conflated and you wind up with the politicized institution. And that has been a very unfortunate trend that I have seen really accelerate since the 2016 election, which was the first time when you had very senior officers speaking, um, in their capacity as senior office, retired senior officers at the Democratic and Republican National Conventions. And I hope we can get away from that because it is not good for institutions. Man, quick reflection in the last two minutes. What I love about what you just really illustrated here is I think it gets to a, the issue I see with with the generals who, who and you know, CIA directors, they, they basically are still stuck in the 80s and 90s when making that statement would have been of huge impact. When someone went like, oh my God, 40 flag off. It's like, no, it, it doesn't, it, yeah. all it does is degrade the institution. Well, also there's no benefit. There's a lot of costs I feel to see. This. So I, I want to do the last uh, quick one minute question. And it's honestly like a personal one from, from my perspective. S- something I struggle with is someone who's like honestly, moderately hawkish. No US boots in the ground in Ukraine. I didn't want the mix to go, but like, I work at a foreign policy think tank where honestly people who orchestrated the Iraq war work at. So I need to be honest about this. I didn't serve in the military. Um, and the number one thing, I know I shouldn't read the YouTube comments, but I always get from aggressive people. The, the one that really affects me in this conversation is, well, how about you go and list then? If you think it's worth risking a war of Taiwan, if you think Putin's so bad, Marshall, go and list, go serve. You're just basically a chicken hawk. I can't get over that one. So I, I just ask like personally, because it's a generational one. Like I was, I was about as young as you could be and still remember 9-11. And I would have to say to them, like, hey, like, what would you have done if you were 18? Would you have gone to like DC and been a think tank fellow or would you have served? Do you have like, do you have any like counsel? Because I know a lot of people, a lot of people kind of feel this way in my 30 something cohort. I, I can tell you, I in the most strident terms, across all categories, really reject the type of insidious identitarianism that has slipped into American life, where we put ourselves into categories and based off of where someone sits in a category, say what they're allowed to think and speak on uh, and shut them down based on identitarian arguments. We do that with, you know, we do it with gender, we do it with race, and, and as you're noting in the issues of, you know, war and peace, you know, we do it sometimes with people's veteran status. And I think it is completely insidious and inappropriate. Like you're an American citizen. You absolutely have a vested interest in issues of war and peace and should speak about them as does as do all American citizens and not American citizens, you know, who are policies impact. So for anyone to come in and make some type of identitarian argument that doesn't deal with the arguments being made by another person on the merits of the argument, but on the person's identity, to me, is anti-intellectual um, and you know, and completely antithetical to creating any type of progress on an issue. So um, the fact that I served in the military or fought in these wars, frankly, uh, doesn't insulate me from having any type of bad idea or dumb policy idea about them. Um, it's a no thing. And if we start breaking down the cr- who's allowed to speak on the most critical issues that affect American life into not the people with the best ideas, but what sort of fenced in identity that they have. I mean, God, it got help us. We're just going to be a, a nation of buffoons. Um, this country is strongest when we're open with one another and we create environments where, you know, the best ideas are allowed to flourish and those ideas are to win. Um, so, yeah, so yes, I can, I've, I, I have observed that happen at times in the national security space. 
Um, but I see it happen at times in all sorts of facets of American life. And it is, it is poison to our democracy. Well, thank you for the, uh, the good monologue and also the good, uh, Pat on the back. I urge listeners to look at my stock picks when they're critiquing my foreign policy, <laughs> not the decision I made um, when I was 18 to not go um, join the Afghan surge, if that was even on the table. Ali, this has been really great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, it's great to speak with you. Yeah, I always enjoy Marshall. I hope we'll do it again soon.